our reading this evening from Hebrews chapter 13. I'm going to start at verse 6 and take us through to verse 16 of Hebrews chapter 13. It begins with a quote, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by all kinds of strange teachings. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by eating ceremonial foods, which have no, no benefit to those who do so. We have an altar from which those who minister at the tabernacle have no right to eat. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are buried outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for that city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. So we're here now in the third day of national mourning following the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Many people feeling in need of God's comfort, encouragement, hope, peace in their grief and their sadness. And we can find all these things in the letter to the Hebrews, particularly in this final chapter. Uh, the message of the, the whole letter to the Hebrews summed up in, in four words, Jesus is the greatest. And especially for Christians who may be weary or discouraged, tempted to wander from their faith, grieving, mourning, Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is greater than the angels greater than Moses, Jesus is greater than the Old Testament, Jesus is greater than that enigmatic priest Melchizedek. Indeed, Jesus is the greatest high priest. And the sacrifice that Jesus has made is greater than all the other sacrifices in the history of the temple. Jesus sacrificed the greatest sacrifice of all, giving of himself once for all for sins on the cross, for our salvation. Jesus is the greatest. The amazing salvation he has provided for us is the greatest. We last looked at the letter to the Hebrews, looking back, it was at the beginning of 2015, so I think we can revisit it again tonight. And let's remind us of some of the inspiring truths we learned then from Hebrews 13, uh, that Jesus Christ, verse 8, is the same yesterday, today, forever, and in this world which is changing ever more quickly. It's so reassuring to know that we worship the God who will never change, who's always the same for us. People have been talking about Her Majesty the Queen being the one unchanging factor in Britain over the last 70 years, but the true unchanging one is God, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday and today and forever. And this leads on to two wonderful promises which our unchangeable God makes for us. Uh, in verse 5, coming just before, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. The writer quotes Deuteronomy. And then in verse 6, so we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Quoting Psalm 118. Whatever the world throws at us, God will never leave us and forsake us. God is our helper. We can trust in him. Our unchanging God will never let us down. Jesus is the greatest and he never changes. His faithfulness is with us always. So we should stop and enjoy that wonderful salvation which Jesus has obtained for us, greater than any other salvation, greater than the blessings of the Old Testament, of Moses and that covenant. It's good for our hearts to be strengthened in grace, not by communal foods which are of no value to those who eat them. We have an altar from which those who minister at this tabernacle had no right to eat. We're strengthened by grace, the grace of God. Hebrews 13 goes on about uh, 
the blood of animals in the sin offering in the most holy place. And he points us to Jesus, also suffered outside the city to make the people holy. Let us therefore go to him outside the camp. Ooh, whatever we may have to suffer, however hard these days may be, however unsettling the events of the last few days, Jesus has already suffered much, much more. And through his suffering, we've become heirs to that eternal city, eternal salvation beyond time and space in the presence of God himself, in the presence of Jesus, our Savior. Jesus is the greatest. What a wonderful salvation. So how should we respond to this? Here are our verses for tonight. Verses 15 and 16. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, and do not forget to do good and share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Let's take the, the second and third of those exhortations. First, doing good sharing with others. God is faithful to us. He'll never abandon us and he'll always be our helper. Um, and that's the standard of brotherly love which God expects us to show to each other. Hebrews 13 verse 1, keep on loving each other as brothers, obeying the new commandment, to love as he has loved us. In simple ways like hospitality, verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so some people have entertained angels without that brotherly love, of course, shouldn't be just restricted to helping uh, folk who will be able to repay our kindness in the future. Verse 3, remember those who were in prison as if you were their fellow prisoners. And those who were ill-treated as if you yourselves were suffering. We help everyone. Do not forget to do good, to share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. We've thought before about those kinds of sacrifices, that kind of love. How God's faithfulness to us inspires us to show brotherly love to others. But in verse 15, Hebrews had talked about a different kind of sacrifice, which is perhaps particularly relevant for us at this time. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name, a sacrifice of praise. Sometimes we don't feel like praising God. Sometimes we forget about all the wonderful blessings God has poured out about on us, uh, the wonderful salvation we've received. Sometimes we forget about God's faithfulness to us. Sometimes the weight of circumstances weighs on us. And it may be that many people are finding it difficult to praise God in these days, in this time of national mourning, following the death of our beloved Queen Elizabeth of blessed memory. But nevertheless, God deserves praise from us, even when we feel the least like praising him. We should still be thanking God for all the blessing he pours out on our lives, moment by moment, day by day. God deserves a sacrifice of praise. And whatever may be happening in the world around us, God is worthy of our praise because of who Jesus is. Jesus is the greatest. And God deserves praise because of the wonderful salvation he has provided for us. God is always worthy of our sacrifice of praise. We give God our money, our offerings. We seek to serve God in our daily lives. We read our Bibles. We seek to be faithful disciples of Jesus. We work hard to present to God our sacrifices of doing good and of sharing with others. But Hebrews 13 and verse 15 reminds us that we should also be offering God our sacrifice of praise. Let's think about that for a few minutes. It was A.W. Tozer who said that God calls us to be worshippers first and workers second. And so often we get things the wrong way around. We expect new Christians to work for God straight away and then leave them to sort out for themselves what it means to worship. And of course, in, in one sense, our work and our worship are two sides of the same coin. They're both sacrifices of lives up and up to God. But 
if we're honest, many of us find it easier to be workers for God than to be worshippers of God. The sacrifice of doing good and sharing with others comes to us curiously more easily than does the sacrifice of praise. But God calls us to be worshippers first and workers second. The shorter Westminster Catechism asks, what is the chief end of man? What is it that human beings were created for? What's our purpose in God's cosmic master plan? The answer it gives is this. The chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And those two activities are meant to be one and the same thing. They're not mutually exclusive. Glorifying God, enjoying him forever, it should be happening at the same time. But when it comes to offering God a sacrifice of praise, many people seem to find it difficult to glorify God and enjoy him at the same time. Worship too often seems like hard work, and especially if we're struggling in aspects of our lives, perhaps particularly at this time of mourning. But if worship is glorifying God and enjoying him, it's strange that sometimes we find it hard, such hard work to worship God. What hints does this verse, Hebrews 13, 15, give us to make our worship easier? Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that confess his name. The first thing this verse com reminds us of is that our sacrifice of praise must be offered through Jesus. We worship on the basis of who Jesus is and for what he has done for us. Uh, and worship isn't acceptable to God if it's not offered through Jesus, his son. Worship can be false if it's based on, on wrong ideas about ourselves. Um, if we ever forget that of ourselves we have no right to come into the presence of the almighty holy God. By ourselves, by our human nature, we are, we are God's enemies, cut off from God by our sins, in line for God's judgment. And to offer God acceptable worship, we must acknowledge our manifold sin and weakness, and wickedness. We must confess we've sinned against God, against our fellow human beings, in thought and word and deed through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, there is no health in us. If of ourselves, we are simply miserable sinners, and we have no righteousness of our own, only that which Jesus has brought for us on the cross. And there is no good in us, only the beauty and purity and love which Jesus shares with us. So our worship to God is only acceptable through Jesus. We're strengthened by his grace alone. Our worship is worthless if for one second we forget our own unworthiness. If we forget the grace of God which has saved us. Our worship can be spoiled if we assume a different relationship to God than that which his son Jesus has brought us into. We've got to avoid the, the wrong extremes of being too distant from God or on the other hand of being too familiar with God. When we worship, we have to ask ourselves, would Jesus address his heavenly Father that way? Uh, would Jesus pray that way? Through Jesus, we continually offer a sacrifice of praise. And in that verse, the second challenge, of course, in our worship comes in that one word, continually. Um, even when we're making progress in worshipping God once a week in our Sunday worship, or in our home groups, or in our personal times with God, this one word challenges us again and again, continually. Because God doesn't just deserve our praise once a week, once a day, uh, but every moment of every day. Our sacrifices of praise should be repeated, continuous. Jesus is the greatest. He deserves nothing less. His sacrifice on the cross for us deserves nothing less. Continuously, even when we don't feel like praising God, even when circumstances are weighing us down and we're struggling to offer our praise, we should offer a sacrifice. 
Ephesians 5 says, Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks to God all the time. Giving thanks to God for everything. When we're together, we do it by speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. But we should also be singing our songs of praise when we're by ourselves. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord. Praising God continually, wherever we are, whatever else we're doing. Not just in spare moments, not just in our times of worship together, but continually praising God as we work. Uh, the Bible commands us to do this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and one admonish one another with all wisdom. As you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Colossians. Whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus. Offer it is an act of thanksgiving, a sacrifice, a praise. Different things we can do to praise God continually. Singing hymns, choruses, spiritual songs. We can use Christian music, books, pictures, helping us to praise God. Uh, we can listen to Christian radio, add our voices to the worship on uh, Christian YouTube videos. I've talked on other occasions about breath prayers, continually offering a, a simple verse, a, a, a prayer as simple as praise you, Lord Jesus. And I've also talked on other occasions about the spiritual gift of speaking in tongues, which is helpful. It allows us to praise God in our spirits, even if our minds have to be in, engaged in other things. It's also important, isn't it, to make time to praise God whenever the Holy Spirit prompts us to. When we see a sunset or a starry sky, a beautiful flower, a bird, an animal, uh, we should resist the temptation to rush on. Instead, take time to praise God. Poet W.H. Davis asked, what is this life so full of care? We have no time to stop and stare. We do have time. We need to make time to praise God continually through Jesus let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise the fruit of lips that confess his name through Jesus continually uh, and this third challenge to offer our praise the fruit of lips that confess his name in other words our praise must be expressed outwardly as well as inwardly our praise should pass through our lips. And of course, God, who he knows our hearts, who knows our every thought, can hear the prayers even if they're in, in our heads silently. But the praise isn't just for God's benefit. Our sacrifice of praise is a declaration of God's greatness to the whole of creation. Not only to the angels who, who echo that praise, but also the principalities and powers who are rebelling against Christ. Our sacrifice of praise should be united with believers who share this praise and it should be declared before the watching world, before the cosmos, who are lost without Christ. 1 Peter 2, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. God saved us so that we may praise him. And here's part of the challenge we face, to declare God's praise continually, and sometimes to declare it in front of others who don't share our faith. This is the sacrifice of praise. Lips that confess the name of Jesus, not only among the faithful, but also among unbelievers. Not just in our personal devotions, not only praising God in church, but also among folk who don't know God yet. We should find opportunities to offer our sacrifice of praise to God every day. And that should be lips that confess the name of Jesus, whoever we're with, wherever we are. People may not feel like praising God in these days. 
we're filled with sadness and grief in this time of mourning. But we should still be counting all our blessings. We should still be praising God, our loving Heavenly Father, for who He is. Jesus is the greatest. We should be praising Him for all that He has done for us in the wonderful salvation we have in Jesus. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name.